Welcome to today's lecture, where we're going to really get into the technical details related to differentially private machine learning. In particular, we're going to start today by talking about differentially private empirical risk minimization. So let's, before we get into uh, too much about like the technical details about differentially private machine learning, let's first uh, set the stage and give you a quick crash course on some of the basic concepts in non-private machine learning, which will prove uh, useful. This is not going to be a, you know, a comprehensive look at non-private machine learning. This is going to state just a few useful terms and like tell you the setup. Uh, if anything here is unfamiliar, you might want to con uh, consider uh, looking into a reference on uh, machine learning. And uh, yeah, hopefully this should mostly be a bit of a review, but if not, I think it might suffice to get by. Okay, so let's start with the formulation of the problem. I'm going to uh, use a rather general formulation of the uh, machine of a machine learning problem, which might seem a bit silly, but it's very expressive uh, in the sense that it'll be able to express a lot of different problems all simultaneously. So we're going to have a data set D, uh, and this will consist of a set of uh, X, Y pairs. Now each point here will have the X, which we'll call the feature vector. And you can think of this as a way of describing whatever the thing is. For example, if this is uh, if you if you're looking at an image classification task, uh, this would just be the image itself. Um, and here the Y, we'll call this the label. For example, if you have a bunch of pictures, you could imagine the labels are pictures of what they uh, these just say what they actually are. For example, uh, the X could be an image of a cat, and the label Y would just be cat, saying that's a cat. So we'll have a data set. And then there's also a problem specific, uh, what's known as a loss function. L. So uh, this will take in both a parameter vector as well as a point. Uh, so this, this will be like a point just like we had here. But this will be what's known as a parameter vector, which tells us uh, which solution uh, we're looking at from the space of all possible solutions. So each point will have a uh, loss function like this. And the idea is that uh, this sort of expresses a loss in terms of how good is this parameter vector in terms of matching the feature with the label. So let's let's just give you a brief example for now. Like um, we'll we'll talk a bit more about different loss functions, but uh, and and stuff like that. But for now, let's just think of the perhaps common uh, or familiar uh, example, which is linear regression. So to draw you a picture of what linear regression is, it's something like the following. You know, there's like the x y plane, and then you know there's a bunch of points. And the question you're looking for, you're, the question you're trying to answer is, uh, can you find a line which is the best fit line for this data set? So something like this, I guess, would be maybe a little bit higher. Let me try again. Yeah, something like that could be uh, the thing we're trying to get here. Because you can see it's a pretty good uh, fit for um, this data set, in particular, the x, y pairs here, the x's will be literally, you know, the x-axis, the value on the x-axis, and the y value will be the value on the y-axis. So now, what is the uh, loss function here, and what is the, uh, what, what, what is the corresponding predictor? So for linear regression, in fact, we have the following loss function. It's typical to use the squared error. So let's see, suppose you have this. This is going to be equal to the inner product of x comma uh, theta minus y squared. So let's take a look at what this loss function kind of measures. You can see that uh, if it's you know a perfect line where all the points are of the form uh, that the their y value is equal to some uh, linear combination of the x's then we can see that this would uh, fit it perfectly and all the losses would be zero. 
but often this isn't the case. Uh, and in particular here, there exists no nothing which would achieve a loss of zero on all the points simultaneously. But you can see here at least that um, you know this this kind of measures the error between the line and the actual value. So in other words, it would be uh, this distance here. Like you look at the distance between uh, the uh, you know what the x times theta is. So that would be this point minus the y value, and you square it. So this sort of like oh, let me just sort of draw it out here. This this sort of distance here is equal to x comma theta minus y. That's that's that quantity there. And the idea is you square these little distances and add them up. And that will give you, if you do that over the entire data set, it gives you that L theta comma D. So this kind of will be the loss for the overall data set, which is just the sum of the individual losses. And you sum over all points in the data set. Okay, so that's essentially uh, an example of uh, you know a loss function and a loss for a data set. So let's let's uh, be a bit more precise as to what we're trying to do. So the problem, like I said, is empirical risk minimization. I'll write this out. Or as it's often called, ERM for short. And all this means is we want to solve the following uh, optimization problem, or at least try to approach the following solution. So the ideal solution, what, what is the best way if we want to minimize uh, this, like, well, let me write like the following. So the goal is to minimize uh, L theta comma D. So in particular, we're going to be given, we're going to be given a data set D. And we're given a, a pair, of, let's say, a pair of the X, Y. And we're also going to be given some parameter space. Which we'll call C. What I mean by parameter space, I mean that uh, you know we're going to be trying to find a parameter vector uh, which contain which which is as good as possible, and but we're going to restrict ourselves by saying we're only going to try to optimize over the set of uh, parameter vectors which belong to some uh, set like this. So parameter set, parameter space, same kind of idea. But the goal is to try to approximate the following solution. Ideally, if uh, you know there were no other computation issues or anything. We'd like to find this data star, which is kind of the optimal uh, value. So this would be argmin L data um, D, but subject to data being in the set C. So yeah, the, this is the ideal solution. We're not going to be able to necessarily get this. But uh, in an ideal world, we'd be able to find uh, the point uh, data, which is in this uh, parameter set C which minimizes the loss function when it's summed up over all the data set. So now we're not going to be able to get that. Uh, this is like the ideal. But instead, what our algorithm, let's put this over here. Our algorithm will output it'll output some data hat rather. And how good is a theta hat? Like the idea is it's, it's trying to get to theta star, but instead it'll give some theta hat. And we'll measure how good an algorithm is in terms of the theta star it outputs um, using a quantity known as, okay, this is gonna be a bit of a long term, but uh, it'll be the expected excess empirical risk. Let, let's try to unpack what these, uh, uh, let, let me write the quantity first, I guess. So it'll be the expectation of the loss on this data hat, comma, uh, D minus 
swath of theta star on B. So let's unpack this. Why do we call it, uh, what, what is the empirical risk? The empirical risk just means like we look at the loss when it's summed over the actual data set. So it's empirical because it's really dealing with the data set itself. Uh, it's excess here because you can see that if it was equal to this, then uh, the amount, if you know, theta hat equals theta star, then we would have zero, uh, zero loss in comparison to the optimal solution, which may not be zero. So really it's looking at how much more error do you incur than the best possible solution, which is why we call the excess uh, empirical risk. And we have the word expected because this is just an expectation. Uh, and where is this expectation? This expectation is over the randomness of the algorithm. So just uh, let me make one thing clear. The important part is the fact that uh, there's no sort of randomness in this quantity. The loss on the data set is just going to be literally the sum of the loss on the points, and the points are sort of given to us as input. So uh, there's no, the, the only randomness here is not in the generation of the data set, but only in whatever our algorithm does. For example, uh, you know, differential privacy will be an expectation over the randomness uh, of whatever noise we add. And similarly, there will be other sources of noise, including things like um, if we use a stochastic method rather than a deterministic method. But we'll, we'll, we'll return to that a bit later. OK. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, there will also be an associated, we're not going to talk about this much in, the, in this lecture, but there will be an associated classifier um, associated with whichever parameter vector that we estimate, say, this theta hat. Uh, the classifier will be something like we take a given a parameter vector, at least for like linear regression. Yeah, this is what I'm going to say just for linear regression, but uh, what is the linear regression problem? You essentially uh, minimize this loss function, and then your predictor will be essentially taking the inner product of whatever point you have with the parameter vector you learned, theta hat, comma, x. Okay, so that is the... Uh, that, that's the sort of um, setup we have here. Um, and this is quite a general setup. You know, like I said nothing about what this function L could be. I said nothing about what this space uh, C could be, uh, where, where the parameter lies. So we're going to have to impose a few restrictions here. If we don't, then it'll be, there'll be no hope of uh, solving the problem in this generality. So let's, let's talk about a few restrictions that we're going to use. Um, so yeah, like the restrictions are here, which we're going to uh, talk about in a second. We're going to define these. But here are the sort of common restrictions that uh, we care about. Um, the first thing is we're going to assume that uh, the diameter of C is bounded. And the other things we're going to uh, assume is that uh, the loss function, treating it as a function of theta for any xi or nyi, this has to be convex as well as L Lipschitz. And we want that for all sort of pairs x, i, y, i, which exist in the data domain. So these are essentially the core restrictions um, which we're going to have. Now, these might not make a lot of sense. You might not be familiar with some of these terms. For example, what is the diameter of a set? Um, convexity, I'm hoping you're familiar with, but we're just going to uh, define in a sec. Lipschitz might not be as familiar to some of you, so we'll, we'll define that. But these are the type of restrictions. We're going to need to have some sort of restriction on the loss functions. Otherwise, you could have some crazy functions, which nobody can really uh, optimize. It could be NP-hard. Um, yeah. So let's uh, talk about some of the terminology we're going to use in today's lecture. Um, the first thing, and perhaps one of the most important quantities in all of machine learning, so this is something you should hopefully remember from your calculus class, which is the gradient. 
So we want the gradient of a function. Uh, suppose we had some function L theta, which maps from R to the D, the R to R. Uh, so there's, there's some function that is, let, let me make this clear. It's a function which takes in a d-dimensional vector and it outputs a single number. So it'll just map to one number. Um, so the gradient, uh, just right here, the gradient at say some, uh, what is it, theta tilde, let's say, is a vector. So we have that uh, it'll be uh, the gradient of L, which is going to be in R to the D. So it's kind of the same dimension as the, the, uh, as the parameter vector theta. So this is going to be uh, a vector in R to the D, where the ith coordinate is the following quantity. It's essentially the partial derivative with respect to theta i of L at theta tilde. So yeah, the gradient is a derivative where you take the derivative with respect to each uh, coordinate and you make a new vector out of that. So yeah, it's a, the gradient takes in a uh, point and it'll give you something which is in uh, sorry, this should be tilde L at this. So it'll give you a vector uh, where each coordinate is a partial derivative. So hopefully you're familiar with that. Um, it's something that's used ubiquitously in uh, machine learning, so you should be familiar. You should, you should get comfortable with it, rather. Um, okay, so that's the first important quantity, which we're going to use uh, a lot in, this, in today's lecture, at least. Um, the next thing you need to know is, I guess, what, what do I mean by the diameter of a set? Uh, we'll use the term, uh, like we'll, we'll use sort of the L2 norm of the set just to represent what the diameter is. And this is essentially the max distance between any two points in C. So yeah, it's a pretty natural uh, uh, definition, the diameter is the max distance between any two points, um, and we'll use the symbol to represent it. Now, next up is convexity. So suppose we have a function L, which is mapping, say, from some C, yeah, like some parameter space C, or parameter set, rather, and it uh, takes in a, uh, yeah, it takes in a parameter and maps to a real number. So we say that this is convex for all, say, pair of the points which lie in the uh, C. Yeah, it's convex if for all points like this. Uh, and for all T which lie in 0, 1. Then we have the following inequality that F on Tx plus 1 minus ty is less than or equal to uh, tfx plus 1 minus t times f of y. So roughly what that says is, you know, let me draw a follow the picture that you'll see a million times here. Um, yeah, so this is a convex function, kind of like the simplest convex function, just the quadratic, or one of the simplest ones. So that essentially says that if you uh, if you take a look at the um, value of a function uh, at a point, say here, and this will be less than the linear combination of its endpoints. So essentially it says that uh, this, so for example, if this is x and this is y, then really sort of a linear combination of the functions at this point is going to be greater than or equal to the function at a linear combination of these values. So yeah, I, I draw this picture all the time, and uh, this is kind of how I remember what uh, convection is, um, and which way sort of the inequality goes.
So that's an important concept also in machine learning. And the final thing, which might not be a bit uh, as, quite as familiar to you, is the, uh, the Lipschitz restriction. This essentially means that uh, the function is sufficiently uh, smooth in some certain sense. So let's see what uh, it means. So again, we're going to work in the same setting, L, which maps from say, C to R. And it'll be L Lipschitz. And in L2 norm, at least, uh, in particular. Then if we have the following guarantee for all x, comma, y, and c, we have the following guarantee that uh, L on x minus L on y is less than or equal to capital L times the L2 norm between x and y. So that kind of says that the function can't change too fast on uh, points which are close to each other, uh, bounding sort of the distance between uh, the function values as the distance between the points times whatever this L is. So one important uh, consequence of this is the fact that uh, this uh, function being L Lipschitz implies a bound on the size of the gradient. In particular, it says that you know the size of the gradient uh, uh, of L in L2 norm is going to be less than or equal to this, the same quantity, the Lipschitz constant. Um, yeah, this is perhaps not too surprising if you, if you look at it and think about it carefully. I think this is a good exercise to actually try to prove for yourself. As a hint, you can think of uh, gradient as a multivariate uh, derivative, and so it might be easier to start with the uh, univariate case. But uh, yeah, try to understand this uh, implication. This will be very useful because, as we'll see later, when you're taking uh, derivatives, or rather taking gradients of a function, and you can say the L2 norm of that gradient is bounded absolutely, then that'll be useful for many of the noise addition strategies we've done uh, many times now in this class. OK, so that is, uh, that's a bunch of the terminology. And like I said, we're going to assume that uh, the parameter set comes, uh, has, that we are searching over has a bounded diameter. We're going to assume that uh, it's a convex set. We're going to assume that the loss function is convex. And we're going to assume that the loss function is also uh, appropriately Lipschitz. Um, there's other types of assumptions which are often made um, in these settings. For which can sometimes give better ERM uh, excess, em empirical excess risk bounds than uh, we are going to talk about today. For example, you might also assume that your um, data set, or sorry, your loss function might, that uh, is additionally strongly convex, meaning that it doesn't just uh, satisfy this inequality, it satisfies it with like a strict inequality. Um, that's a common thing that uh, people assume, which will give you better rates uh, and better accuracy. Similarly, you could also assume certain smoothness uh, uh, conditions, but these aren't really things we're going to focus on in today's lecture. Um, we're just going to keep it simple and look at some of the bare minimum things that you can do in order to get good answers. And if you're curious, you can look up uh, more. So yeah, there's some terminology that will be useful. Next up, uh, let's, let's uh, talk a bit more about the loss function. In particular, we just um, saw one loss function. We saw like the linear regression one. Let's see that again. Okay, in all the following examples, I'm going to assume that x and uh, both x and theta are in, uh, these are all in, say, r to the d. But what are some of the different loss functions we might consider? Well, one is for the problem of linear regression. In this case, we have that, uh, you know, we, we have y being a real number because it's a numeric label. Um, and we have that the loss function on theta x, y is going to be equal to the inner product of x comma theta and uh, minus y and square that, the squared loss. So that's what we already talked about. Um, another case is logistic regression, where this is, instead of being, it's not actually a real regression problem even, this is a regression problem, but this is actually a prediction or classification problem. In this case, we're going to have like labels where each point is going to have either uh, plus or minus one label. And uh, here, the loss function is going to be the following. 
it's going to be the following log 1 plus e to the minus y times the inner product of x comma theta. So this is one of kind of the most common uh, classification problems, simplest classification problems. The next one is the median, in particular, the geometric median. This is a common one to study. Um, in particular, uh, I'll note that this is an unsupervised task, so there isn't really a meaningful y. There's no like label for the points. Um, and now the loss function, l theta x y, I'll leave y here even though the function doesn't use it. This is equal to uh, the distance in L2 norm minus the uh, uh, feature vector and the point itself. And yeah, let me, this, this might be a bit unfamiliar, but like, uh, okay, for before we continue, let me comment that this is one Lipschitz. It's not too hard to, um, to see that. Um, yeah, just, just kind of by looking at what the loss function is, is clearly one Lipschitz. Uh, the other thing I'll comment is that this is kind of related uh, to the mean. So if you want to compute the mean of a data set, this would have uh, like the loss function being equal to this quantity squared. So it would be just uh, theta minus x, L2 norm squared. But yeah, you can check that this corresponds to uh, the actual definition of the mean, the more familiar one, by just uh, taking the derivative and setting that gradient equal to zero. And you'll see that's kind of um, defined, that, that, that's how we classically see the mean. Unfortunately, there's no, not a simple way of um, defining what points satisfy the geometric median, so we have to solve it other ways. But yeah, let me just comment a bit more about the geometric median and say this is in one dimension just equal to the classical median that you've already seen. In particular, in 1D, 1D, this is just equal to the absolute value between um, data and x, which is, yeah, just you're trying to find the point which minimizes these quantities. Um, okay, and I guess the last example which I'll mention is a uh, common one. Um, in particular, I'll mention it a bit in our uh, a bit more in our uh, discussion of like privacy attacks. But we'll talk of we'll mention support vector machines. It's a fancy sounding name, but just kind of means linear classifier. So these are often called SVM for short. And this one, like I said, it's a classification task. So y is in plus minus one, and the loss function is going to be. Uh, the hinge, what's known as the hinge loss. Uh, this is going to be equal to max of zero comma one minus y uh, x inner product with data. And why they call this the hinge loss is just because the you know the value of this function um, can easily be seen to look something like this. Uh, this function, if you plot this function, it just looks like following. Yeah, just like this. So, okay, that's the, uh, that's, those are four different loss functions. And you can see how essentially this very simple type of uh, framing of the problem, um, this sort of uh, empirical risk minimization framing, can express many different common uh, machine learning problems like regression problems, logistic regression, geometric median, support vector machines, all just by changing and properly defining the uh, loss function. So it's rather general. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of it for different types of loss functions. We'll revisit some of these, especially these latter two, just to sort of give you concrete examples and we'll see how exactly, uh, you know, uh, privacy violations can come up. Okay, the next thing is, suppose we just want to, suppose we want to solve this, um, how do we solve it? That's essentially asking how do we solve the ERM problem? Um, and this is the core question in the entire field of optimization. Uh, pretty much everything that optimization studies is uh, relevant to this problem. And I'll mention that, uh, yeah, why is this an optimization problem? Like remember, 
the uh, goal is to try to find something which is as close to possible as possible to theta star, which is you know arg min of l on theta d. So this is just an optimization problem because we're trying to find the theta which minimizes this. And there's many different approaches. Um, for example, like we'll talk later in today's lecture about uh, gradient descent. Um, this is perhaps the most flexible framework of different uh, approaches, gradient descent and all its friends and family. Will, um, is kind of the most popular type of optimization. But there's many more approaches as well, which um, I won't mention too much right now. In particular, all I'm just going to say is that for some parts of this lecture, we're just going to assume that uh, a non-private optimizer exists. Assume a non-private optimizer exists just for now. Um, and towards the in the last segment of this lecture, we'll talk about a specific non-private optimizer, in particular gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent. But uh, just think for now that we have a black box, a non-private optimizer, which we'll, um, which we'll use uh, just to um, solve some problems non-privately. OK, uh, what else do we want to talk about? We want to also mention about uh, generalization. So let's return to the actual problem statement that we're looking at here. We're looking at the problem statement uh, which tries to do, again, the name as the name suggests, empirical risk minimization. Like, um, it's very much as looking at how much uh, error we get on the data set itself. So this is like the given training set data set, let's say. Uh, we're looking at how much error we can get on the training set data set and trying to minimize that. But that's not typically what we want in a machine learning setting. We don't want to be able to say like, oh, we classify the training data set perfectly and we get very low loss. What we really want is something, uh, we want something known as generalization. That is, uh, if we have data, we, we want really the following thing. If we had a test point generated from the same distribution as the training data, then the expected, the, the loss on this new point drawn from this distribution will be small. So you can see how this is kind of similar. Uh, where you know we're trying to minimize the loss on the training data, but how do we argue that in fact the data that we get will also have a small loss on a new test point drawn from the same data set? And like I said, this is called this phenomenon. If it does that, is called generalization. Now, generalization is a very rich question, like trying to understand when classifiers do and do not uh, generalize. But at least just for for today, we're going to kind of put this aside. And I'll, all I'm going to say is uh, often there's a type of argument known as a uniform convergence. Uh, this is one way of proving generalization, not the only way. But roughly, you know, we, we talked about it a bit earlier in this class in the private pack learning, if you remember, but very briefly. Um, and roughly, you can say that if you have uh, uniform convergence, if you have uniform convergence plus an empirical risk minimizer, then this implies generalization. So this is kind of, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to get into this today, but uh, really solving the ERM problem will tell you important information about generalization uh, as well. OK, and the last thing we're going to talk about before we get into some more technical uh, approaches is privacy considerations. So maybe maybe we've already seen enough of these. Like I've told you enough cases where privacy is an issue, but these have all been sort of from a relatively higher level point of view. Let's let's talk a little bit more uh, technical and a little bit low level to see where these privacy considerations come in. So again, uh, the goal. Let me just say it one more time. We're trying to find a parameter. Uh, we're trying to find a parameter vector theta hat, let's say, uh, which minimizes uh, the like loss function L on theta d. Let me just put a dot here saying that that's the parameter we're trying to minimize it with respect to. Um, but yeah, we're trying to find a theta hat which minimizes this function. 
But the, also thing, the, the other thing we want is that theta hat is differentially private with respect to D. That is, it does not uh, leak information about D in sort of the standard sense we've talked about all through this course. Um, and to see that, in fact, solving this problem might give information about uh, the data set D, let's consider a simple example, such as the uh, median. The median we've seen many times, and you should be familiar with it. But essentially, you know, suppose you have some uh, data set this color. So we have some data set, uh, say a bunch of different x's, these are our points. And if we have an odd number of points, the thing is the median of this data set is going to be exactly equal to uh, the, the middlemost point if we have an odd number of points. So we can see already that this is kind of blatantly privacy violating. Um, it exactly is equal to one of the points, so therefore um, you know, this is not going to be uh, differentially private. So a naive method here for trying to compute what the median is will clearly not work because it outputs one of the data points exactly, not uh, insensitive to this uh, addition or removal at this point. On the other hand, uh, like this, this is just a simple example, like perhaps I just picked one that was very familiar, but let me tell you actually a bit uh, about SVMs, what a support vector machine is. So a support vector machine is essentially trying to classify linear, it's trying to be a linear separator. So for example, let's suppose, um, like I said, we're, we're going to imagine in this setting that we have plus ones and minus ones. Um, so let me just write these as plus and minus. So imagine our data set looks something like this, uh, where you know, we have maybe plus, 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 plus. And we have minuses over here, minus, minus, minus. And what the the support what a support vector machine tries to do is it tries to find the hyperplane which has the maximum margin between these two classes. So in other words, it's trying to separate the the pluses and the minuses, but in particular, it's trying to find the one which uh, which kind of is the furthest distance from the closest point in both of these sets. So let's say it should look something like the SVM solution would look something like this. That's cool. You can see that this is kind of the best possible, okay, this is a vague statement, but it's kind of like one of the best possible classifiers because it's as far as possible from uh, the minuses and as far as possible from the pluses. In particular, even a point that would say like over here and a minus uh, would still be classified correctly. So that's cool, but the issue, why am I mentioning this in the privacy violations? Uh, sorry, let me just emphasize one more time. That would be a valid uh, like uh, SVM solution, but say, uh, or it would be the optimal SVM solution, but say something more like this, which indeed still separates the plus and the minuses, but now it's not that far away from its closest uh, plus point. So this is not going to be the right answer that we're looking for. All right, so we've got this uh, sort of maximum margin separating hyperplane, as we kind of call it. The thing is, I claim that this is also very uh, susceptible to uh, the addition or removal of a single point. Uh, why do I say that? Um, because really, this is actually a well-known fact about SVMs, is that it can be written as a linear combination of its support vectors. What are the support vectors? The support vectors are the points which are closest to it. So for example, on the this side, we have that this point is the closest one to it. So that's one of the support vectors. And on this side, I guess this point over here is going to be the closest one. So this is a support vector. Now, the tough part is, like, basically the idea is that this theta vector, the one which sort of uh, defines a separating hyperplane, this can be written as a linear combination of the support vectors. And this should immediately scream out, uh, you know, something's going wrong here, because if the optimal solution can be written as a linear combination of some of the data points, that's clearly not differentially private. Just to give one sort of pictorial example of uh, why this caused a problem, like I said, is trying to maximize the margin between the closest points. So suppose you put one additional point here, 
uh, when you've colored orange, but one point which is right next to this uh, hyperplane here, then this would cause the uh, hyperplane to try to increase the margin from that as much as possible. And therefore, this would kind of jump over in this direction, making this the new hyperplane. So this is the prime. Now, you might think that this is kind of, uh, OK, this is not that big a shift. But you can imagine that there's more extreme cases where perhaps uh, the margin was much, much larger. And in fact, that would result in this uh, parameter vector theta changing quite dramatically. So yeah, what, am I, what I'm trying to say is all I'm trying to get across here is that in some of the uh, simple cases, just median and SVM, you can see that uh, these, uh, the classic classifiers without any sort of um, privacy considerations are going to be uh, not differentially private, essentially revealing data points in the data set, uh, in the training data set, in the clear. So therefore, we're going to have to be a little bit more sophisticated in terms of our approaches if we want to avoid privacy violations of this nature. And in particular, we're going to uh, look at a few different approaches uh, in the next two parts, or at least the next parts. We'll see how many parts this ends up being. But uh, one approach, is, the first approach we're going to look at is called output perturbation. where we compute a non-private uh, classifier, and then we uh, uh, just perturb the output. This is like perhaps the most familiar way, because this is what we've been doing kind of this entire class. We compute something non-privately, then we perturb it according to its sensitivity. Uh, the next approach we'll look at is objective perturbation. And this is kind of a little bit, uh, this is a little bit weird, actually. So it's a little bit different from what you've seen before. But we don't actually. Uh, uh, add noise to the output of the function. This time what we're going to do is we're going to take our loss function and add appropriately chosen noise to the loss function itself. And that will turn out to be differentially private. And the third method, which we'll talk about, uh, and kind of the most popular one nowadays, is gradient perturbation. And in this setting, what happens is you well, like skipping ahead a bit, I'll mention that, like I said, the most common approach to solving problems nowadays is gradient descent. So what we're going to do is essentially run gradient descent, but with noise added in the appropriate places in order to make it differentially private. And by perturbing the gradients, we'll make the overall process uh, differentially private. So like I said, these are the three most common uh, methods for differential privacy in terms of machine learning. Uh, mostly gradient perturbation, let's say. Uh, and we'll go through those all one by one in various levels of detail. I'll mention that there's another approach which might seem obvious, like, okay, output perturbation, objective perturbation, and so on. But one thing, what about input perturbation? Um, by that, you know, can we just perturb the input uh, to our machine learning task? And then after that, everything else we do will be private by post-processing. Well, this seems promising, but the downside is that this is like pretty much equivalent to local differentially, locally, local differential privacy, which, as I've kind of mentioned before, um, generally results in a lot more data usage. Um, yeah, it takes a lot more data in order to compute anything uh, to the same level of accuracy. So in other words, if you did input perturbation, this is going to lose a lot of uh, a lot of accuracy, and it's something even more than the other approaches, and it's something we're generally not going to consider. In particular, we're not going to talk about it in today's uh, lecture. But yeah, in the next parts, we're going to go into output perturbation, objective perturbation, as well as gradient perturbation.